guide you continually and provide for you, even in parched places. He will rescue your bones. He will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. Welcome to this service of worship. We are glad that you are with us um, as we um, begin a new series with the Follow Me series um, in honoring God's diversity. Um, we do have community notes that you will find at the end of the video, but in this moment, let us further prepare for worship together by making use of the questions that are before you. gift of true peace is meant for everyone. We often get in the way of that. We've got to admit this to God and each other. Let us begin with silent prayer.
Holy God, you give voice to so much. You speak through so many that we sometimes miss what they are all saying together. The voice of the hungry, the unsheltered, the infirmed, the lonely, the lost, the lowly, the imprisoned, the outsider, the isolated, the poor, the helpless. With so many voices, we give, in to the, we give in to the fear that our own voice will be lost, swallowed up by so much need out there. Help us be steady and trust you to carry us as always. Help us to trust your urging that work that we work beside you. Help us to trust to have faith. Gratefully, we pray this. Thank you for listening, God. Amen. There is something unmistakable, something undeniably authentic about being with each other in person. Now that said, the virtual has served us well for generations. From the moment that we put words to page and allowed them to carry our intangible thoughts and unreachable dreams to generations of people we would never meet, we have sought ways to connect beyond what's been given to us. Now this video, social media, books, even gossip are all ways that we try to extend a part of ourselves beyond ourselves. And so please take this sermon here as a good faith effort to reach out to you with, well, with not just my faith, but with the faith of everyone who got us here and the faith that draws us together now. In short, to God's spirit be the glory. One of the things that makes computers so appealing to some is that they have very strict rules. In fact, I remember one of my computer teachers in grade school telling us that computers are idiots. They're dumb. They can only do what they are told to do. And given how sophisticated our computers can be now, that can seem laughable, right? But, but it's still very much true. My phone, tablet, watch, your computer, they are all only as functional as the apps that I load and use on them, right? The article or blog doesn't exist until I write it. That image isn't great until I capture it. That movie isn't made until I edit it. That schedule um, or that map, that web search aren't made until I decide to make them. Even artificial intelligence, AI, cannot be until we teach it. Computers can only count and calculate. It isn't until we interact with them that they become more, much, much more. And it's what makes our present moment so interesting. We've had a period of time where we fell out of the habit of interaction. 
I just finished reading a rant by someone who opposes self-checkout machines in the grocery store. Now think about it. The shelves are stocked with little to no interaction. We park with little to no interaction. We shop with little to no interaction. We line up with little to no interaction. Then we process, bag, and buy our groceries with little to no interaction. Then we leave with no little to no interaction. We, we pay with little to no interaction. We don't even have to touch the kiosk. It is impossible to go, it is, actually it is possible rather to go to Food Lion or Walmart or Harris Teeter or Publix or some other store, Aldi's, shop for groceries and get home without having spoken to another human being at all. It sounds healthy, doesn't it? Almost as healthy as the idea that there are homeless in Burlington and surrounding areas who might go months never having actually spoken to another human being. How do you think that affects a person? Or imagine the number of children, much more than half, I might add, who are on free and reduced lunch that go to Garrett Elementary School, whose most complete healthy meal um, that they would eat would come while school was in session. What do you imagine they're eating this summer? You know, we have a number of people in our congregation who have become widows or widowers. And after decades of being identified as a pair, what is it like now that that loved one is not here? Those examples of isolation aren't unique to our generation. And they only scratch the surface on the ways that we isolate each other, whether it's I don't know whether it's language or culture, behavior, wealth, fear, ignorance, apathy, pain. We can be too quick to allow our miseries to take over and dominate our worldview. And we press for less pain so that we opt for numbness. We want more safety so we fortify our physical and mental arsenals. We settle for calm when what we really want is peace. This is what God is trying to address in, the, in this all-important passage that's coming to us from Isaiah. This is Isaiah 58, verses 5 through 11. God's preferred version of fasting. Listen for the word of God to us all and to this generation and for your place in God's story. God says, Is this the kind of fast that I choose? A day of self-affliction, of bending one's head like a reed, and lying down in mourning cloths and ashes? Is, that, is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to Yahweh? Isn't this the fast that I choose? Releasing wicked restraints. Untying the ropes of a yoke, setting free the mistreated, and breaking every yoke. Isn't it sharing your bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless poor into your house? Covering the naked when you see them and not hiding from your own family. Then your light will break out like the dawn and you will be healed quickly. Your own righteousness will walk before you and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Then you will call and Yahweh will answer. You will cry for help and God will say, I'm here. If you remove the yoke from among you, the finger pointing, the wicked speech, if you open your heart to the hungry and provide abundantly for those who are afflicted, your light will shine in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noon. The Lord will guide you continu continually and provide for you even in parched places. He will rescue your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in the passage, the people are so far down the road of their own self-delusion that they've come to expect, to assume, God should be blessing them. Rather than see God's grace in their own lives as gifts, they feel entitled, entitled, inherently deserving. And if you think our generation doesn't suffer this disease, 
Well, just take a minute and make a list of the things that you've earned versus the things that God has provided. Which list is longer? And if you think you've earned more than you've been God provided, your theology is in trouble. Look, God counter complains to the people that they've got it wrong, to the people who want to say to God, we've done what you required, we've done as you've asked, what do we, what do we have to show for it? God responds, no you haven't. And in fact, I love the way that God presents the divine view of everything as a question. It, it reminds me of the true gift of children, especially young children. They remember how to ask questions. They are naturally and necessarily curious. And the rest of us could make a lot more of our lives if we recovered the skill. God says, is this the fast that I choose? In other words, you whining because the faith contract isn't on your terms, no. I mean, I can't number the times that I complain about God not answering my prayers because God's answer was not what I was looking for. It's ridiculous when you get right down to it. You know, it's, it's like if I asked your name, but no matter what you wanted to say, I expected you to say Virgil homunculus. And then you call, and then call you liar because you didn't say that. Again, it's ridiculous. And so God calls them out. And the list that God provides is specific, isn't it? What does God say? Releasing wicked restraints, untying the ropes of a yoke, setting free the mistreated, and breaking every yoke. Isn't it sharing your bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless poor into your house, covering the naked when you see them and not hiding from your own family? You know, for all the energy and effort that we put into them, it's conspicuous to me that the words safety, security, protection, comfort zone, tribe... None of those words appear in God's list. And while we talk a good game about we're all human and the world is our family, how in the world do we typically interpret the tail end of verse 7? What does that mean to us? Being a part of what God wants means less making sure that you get what's yours and more making sure that things are right for you and everyone else. That our responsibilities before God swing more broadly than the confines of our own interests. And this disconnect with the will of God and the will of humanity is ancient. It is not new. And it is the reason that Jesus quotes Isaiah that day in the synagogue. This is an excerpt. Um, a, a, it's an extended one from Luke chapter 4 verses 16 through 35. Jesus preaches in his hometown. And that's an important detail. Listen further for the word of God to us all and for our ongoing place in God's story. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and, and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally did and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He, unscrolled, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed upon him. He began to explain to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Everyone was raving about Jesus, so impressed were they by the gracious words flowing from his lips. They said, This is Joseph's son, isn't it? Then Jesus said to them, Undoubtedly, you will quote this saying to me, Doctor, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. He said, I assure you that no prophet is welcome in the prophet's hometown. 
And I can assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time, when it didn't rain for three and a half years and there was a great food shortage in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to a widow in the city of Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. There were also many persons with skin diseases in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them were cleansed. Instead, Naaman the Syrian was cleansed. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with anger. They rose up and ran him out of town. They led him to the crest of the hill on which their town had been built so that they could throw him off the cliff. But he passed through the crowd and went on his way. Jesus went down to the city of Capernaum in Galilee and taught the people each Sabbath. They were amazed by his teaching because he delivered his message with authority. A man in the synagogue had the spirit of an unclean demon. He screamed, Hey, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. The demon threw the man down before them, then came out of him without harming him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, y'all, his reputation is solid. The anticipation, right, is palpable. What do they say? I heard he healed some people. I heard he put the leadership in their place. I heard that Marianne and Jake got gallons and gallons of wine for their wedding. Well, we're his hometown. Can you imagine what he'll do for us? And there it is, right? What will Jesus do for us? What will God do for me? Shouldn't God do more for a holy person than for some creep? I'm Christian. Shouldn't God be of more benefit to me than to someone who isn't? And quoting examples from the Old Testament, Jesus' answer simply was no. No, actually. Elijah was sent to Zarephath, a non-Jewish town. Elisha, he'll name it, an enemy war general. And so the people got mad. They got mad at the thought that God would put someone other than God's own people ahead of them. They got mad enough to want to throw Jesus off a cliff. Dude, we can look at this and try and be surprised, but the truth is, if there is one characteristic that floats to the top nowadays, it's anger, isn't it? I mean, I see it everywhere, even within our own committee meetings sometimes, within marriages, with, with parent-child interactions, within our individual selves. Anger. So much anger. But in giving ground to the anger... I think we, I think all of us, humanity is missing God's point. It isn't that God blesses those out of the fold to the exclusion of those in the fold. I mean, it's like the father says to the older son in the Luke 15 parable, everything I have is yours. But working to make things right for all, not just me, is putting myself with, with God's agenda. It makes me a part of the kind of change that our world needs, and it honors the breath of life that God gave, not just to me, but to every person that I encounter. I can't always know the life of purpose um, that, that, a, that a random child or a hungry person or a homeless person or a lonely person or a hateful person or a quiet person or an obnoxiously loud person or an unconventional person or an older person or a younger person or a foreign person or a faithful person or a faithless person person. I can't always know their purpose, but I can certainly know that they are here on purpose. The other thing that I can know for sure is that God wants them and me to have peace, real peace. You know, when I read the demon possession stories in the Bible, I don't always know what the thinkers say, right? Uh, I mean, what is it that the biblical writer actually saw that they are trying to describe? And, and the answer that I've heard from folks as I've asked that question has varied um, according to the variety of perspectives that are among us now. 
mean, some people have told me that they think that it's it's actually a demon from the pit of hell, an embodied spirit, if you will. I've also heard people say on the other extreme that they don't think it's that at all. They think it's just some form of mental illness that they didn't know what to do with, and so they just called it demon possession. And I've heard lots of people say things that are a bit in between. But y'all, maybe that's the point. I mean, in the end, what Jesus gives to the man who's described as possessed is not a temporary reprieve or a season of calm. Jesus gives him peace, lasting peace from his ailment. I mean, it just doesn't matter what the, what the mission was. Or it doesn't matter if it was a demon or not. It doesn't matter um, if, if, it was, if, if it was a condition or not. It doesn't matter if it was him harboring for years the sense that he was not worthy of God's grace. Jesus came to bring him peace. And that's our mission too. Whatever we might say about demons, the demons that we confront, we are all supposed to be in the exorcism business. We are all supposed to be working for peace, the setting right of things, just as it's described in Isaiah and just as Jesus demonstrated for us in this story. In this way, we honor the simplicity of God's purpose for peace and the various complicated ways that it shows up, whether it's the breath of life given to all or the promise of Abraham meant for all, the task of faith given to all, to Jesus Christ coming to all, literally all. Let us all be about God's actual will and not what we think we're entitled to have. In the name of the one, who gives to us as freely as anyone else. Amen. I want you as you are, not as you are to be. Won't you lay down your guard and come with me? The shame that grips you now is crippling. It breaks my heart to see you suffering. Cause I'm for you. I'm not against you. If you want to know how far my love can go, just how deep, just how Oh, oh, oh.
So in our church, we give in a number of ways. We give of our time through service of mission, like the Habitat Build we just finished um, helping with. We give of our prayers. We give financially through the tithing box in the worship space interest by mail, online, at the church office, in person. Um, we give of ourselves wherever we are, even if it's a bingo game. Thus, God chooses to bless us abundantly. We should respond by choosing to be blessings abundantly. This is why we should give and share what we have and who we are. Let us reflect together. Let us pray. Let there be no doubt, great God. You bless us, and we are grateful. Let there be no doubt, great God. We should be blessings in turn. As we receive the gifts you provide, may the gifts we are meant to be emerge. In the great name of Jesus Christ, we pray this together. Amen. We are a part of a faith that's larger than ourselves, and so let us say together what we believe using the affirmation of faith that is before you. I believe in God's grace, that God forgave us at creation, that God forgave us at the flood, that God forgave us with the Ten Commandments. That God forgave us when we rejected God as king. That God forgave us when we ran away from preaching to Nineveh. That God forgave us when we ignored God's word. That God forgave us when we crucified the Christ. That we didn't know what we were doing. Now, God's grace, by the resurrection of Christ and the power of God's Spirit, doesn't just meet the moment, but spans generations to reconcile the world and mark us as chosen, mark us as forgiven, mark us for the joy God takes in us. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we pray together, um, God invites us to the table as we are, given who we are. God invites us to the table even though we might think we don't belong. Yet God invites us does not force us because God still loves us. So let us answer together as one church across time, across our homes, across our various situations, and eat and drink of what the Lord provides. Let us pray together. The Lord be with you and also with you. Creator God, you can do whatever you want. You could have things any way you wish. You set the stars on their paths and raised up mountains and fathomed the depths of the seas in everything you made. You chose to make all of us. Despite the mess we make of your world, you embrace us anyway in all of our variety. Thank you, great God. Lord Jesus, just as the world came to be because of you, so our salvation came to be. You call us to discipleship despite our efforts to be at war with each other and within ourselves. Thank you, great Christ. Holy Spirit, you inspire and comfort and make your presence known even when we try to ignore you. Just as Jesus promised, please fill us now. Shape us, shape each of us from within that we might become the community of your dreams. Teach us to let go of tribalism and the laziness of generalizations. Help us to embrace instead your wondrous, ongoing work of redemption in all its variety. Thank you for continuing to be when for ourselves. And so in honor of you, trying God, let us be godly people. Let us make a habit of compassion and consolation. Let us make second nature your grace and mercy and sense of justice. Let us set aside safety and embrace risk-taking with you. May your healing balm reach through us to those around us, especially those on our prayer list and those we will come to know. And despite our collective answer of violence, of disdain, of division, of cynicism to your love, may we truly be washed by you and embrace hope instead. Hear us now as we lift up to you then by your invitation, our personal prayers.
Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for transforming us. Thank you for teaching us even how to pray when words fail us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus did take the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. Gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, and after pouring it out, he blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed by my blood for the forgiveness of many. All of you, drink of it. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For they shall come from north and south and east and west to sit at table in God's kingdom. Let us eat and drink and be glad and be healed. The only proper response to God's grace is gratitude. And so with that in mind, let us pray the prayer that is before you. Thank you, God, for making us your kingdom. Help us live out that thanks by being a refuge to all you call us to. Thank you for including us at your table. Help us do the same with ours. In the great name of Jesus Christ, we pray this together. Amen. Let us together say our benediction. Let us all be about God's actual will and not what we think we're entitled to have. Get up. Take heart. Jesus is still calling you. And as you go, may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds this day, this weekend, and forevermore. Amen. We too should be voicing our love and rejoicing with glad adoration. A song let us raise till all things now living unite in thanksgiving to God in the highest. Hosanna and praise. Among the community notes that we want to make sure that you are aware of and that you take note of, we begin with the idea of our August 13th upcoming meeting. Um, As you may be aware, we recently put a pause on our evening service in order to evaluate and refresh and renew and reconsider, to reimagine, if you will. And so with this in mind, we gather at 6 p.m. to dream and discuss and to eat. And that last part's important because with the meal being catered, we will need you to please RSVP by Wednesday, August the 9th, in order for us to have a food count. 
um, for that meeting. And so just follow the link that's listed for you on the, on the screen. Uh, if you've got more questions or you'd rather, um, rather make your reservation by phone, you can call the church office and do it that way. Um, but we look forward to seeing everyone and to having the conversation. We also want to remind you that um, we are doing, as per usual, our service at Compass Health and Rehabilitation. And we really could use your help with the service. Um, we need folks to help prepare the communion elements to gather residents um, who need assistance to help residents during the service, like with turning pages and that kind of thing, um, and also to help residents get back in place. And all of this takes place, again, at um, Compass Health and Rehabilitation. We meet at the door closest to the chapel, and if you're facing the front door, it's the door to the right end of the building. Um, but we meet at the um, chapel entrance at 1.30 p.m. And so we look forward to seeing you. We look forward to having a service. And we look forward um, to gathering together once again by God's invitation. And thanks for all that you do.